or weathered a piano is if you put a really accomplished musician in front of you. Thank you, Jay. I'm going to pick up where Mark left off. <laughs> Abraham didn't focus on his own impotence and say it's hopeless. This hundred-year-old body could never father a child. Nor did he survey Sarah's decades of infertility and give up. He didn't tiptoe around God's promise, asking cautiously skeptical questions. He plunged into the promise and came up strong, ready for God, sure that God would make good on what he had said. And that's why it is said, Abraham was declared fit before God by trusting God to set him right. But it's not just Abraham, it's also us. The same thing gets said about us when we embrace and believe the one who brought Jesus to life when the conditions were equally hopeless. The sacrificed Jesus made us fit for God. He set us right with God. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Now I have some news for y'all this morning. Not one person sitting or standing in this room is really good enough to be here. It's just not that way. Maybe I should not have been quite so blunt. Maybe, maybe I'll try again and be a little bit more sensitive in how I, get, how I open my message. Let's see what happens here. I have some news for you this morning. God is not impressed with the one of us in this world. Well, I can tell you that that was not a better, much better way to start either. I, don't know what's going on here. Give me one more crack at it, if you will. Here goes. I have good news for you this morning. Every single one of us is a complete and utter failure. I think I'm going to quit. I'm not making any headway. Maybe I ought to change the scripture, and I would have a little bit better luck. But it's difficult to preach God. Paul's letter to the Roman people because this document is heavy, heavy, heavy in all sorts of ways. It's dense and it's a demanding piece of correspondence. Paul writes this letter to a congregation that he did not start. That's an obstacle right there. That he does not know any of the people. That's another obstacle right there. From the first sentence onward, he lays out chapter after chapter after chapter of his deepest theology. The gospel is the power of God for the salvation of the world. Those are his words in chapter 1. It is possible, he goes on, for every creature in the creation to know God and to love God. Yet somewhere, somehow, this love gets mixed up and gets tangled up and by the end of the first chapter, Paul says all of us, every one of us, has a tendency to exchange the truth for, for a lie. We worship the creature rather than the creator. And we have no excuse. In other words, not a one of us is good enough really to be here in God's house. God's not impressed with any of us. None of us, every single one of us, is just a mess. That's all you can say. Or, as Paul puts it in words that we're familiar with, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, I'll admit it's a little bit early, before 10 o'clock, to take this heavy kind of scripture and swallow it. It's difficult to swallow it. And when we hear Paul speak, if I didn't know better, I always think that I would be thinking that Paul's simply going to lay me out. And he's going to lay all of us. Tell us how bad we are. Yet, as Paul begins his letter to the Romans, 
he issues a very heavy, where am I getting all these legal terms and my thing and Mark comes up with, we get a heavy indictment because this is the beginning, this is the beginning, folks, of God's good news to us. None of us are good enough to be here, and I think we know that. Look around, though. Here we are. How come we're here? Because God laid it in our hearts to be here. God may not be impressed with any of us in this room, but good news. God loves us in spite of our spotty, sketchy records of achievement. Every one of us, every single one of us, we're failures, but God proves his love for us. You know these words, in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. This is what it says in the book of Romans. And this good news is the power, the power of God for the salvation of the world. 1966, I was 18 years old. I was a freshman at Millsaps College down in Jackson, Mississippi. Not only that, folks, I was a certified Sunday school graduate. Not only that, I had served as the president of the youth council at the church to which I was going. Well, we were on a student Bible study there in college, and the study was on Paul's letter to the Romans, and I knew Oh, I knew. I'd been to church all my life. I knew all the Bible stories, the Jesus stories. I knew about Abraham, how old he and Sarah were. I couldn't quite buy into it, but I knew the story, and Genesis was there for me. I did have a few memory verses I could recite. Jesus wept. I could come up with a drop of a hat, no problem. But I had never even touched the book of Romans. So that e first evening, we were flipping through the chapters. And for some reason, as we flipped through, I found that verse in the third chapter where it said, what I repeated a minute ago, all have said and come short of the glory of God. And that verse hit me. It hit me hard. And I remember the feeling that I had because what it said to me was, I have sinned and I have fallen short. And when I read that and digested it and chewed on it, suddenly I felt this very strange, odd feeling of relief. Because I've been away from home now, and the authority, and the rules, and the discipline, for about six weeks. Now, I don't know whether you all remember your first six weeks when you went away to college, but I certainly hope my mother never found out about it. And I'm sure God knew, but he forgave me. But, you know, it, it, it just it laid me out and gave me relief, though, at the same time. And all of us, all of us, have fallen short at some point. And we can stop beating up on ourselves for not measuring up. The truth is, no matter how good we are, we'll never be good enough. And that's okay. Because life is not about us ever being able to measure up. Folks, if you don't hear anything else, hear this. Life is about God. Life is about God who moves toward us through His Son, Jesus Christ, so that He can span the distance between us and God. Jesus is our bridge. Jesus is the way we get there. Let that sink in for a moment. And there's something that really is comforting and healing about this. If we came to church this morning thinking, huh, I'm good enough to go to church, Paul looks at us every one and he says, get real, buddy. He says, get real. Nobody has the capacity to be good enough. And the good news is, the great news is that God is not bound by my limitations. God is not bound by our limitations. God loves us for who we are in spite of what we are, 
because we really don't know yet who or what we are. So, Paul says, there is no distinction since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. And then in the very next breath, he says, and they are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ that is made effective through faith. And that's the point of why we're sitting here this morning. Before the church got to be such big, big business, this is what all of the excitement was about. That God loves, starting with John and going all the way around the Deborah, every blessed one of us. And for that reason alone, God sent Jesus into this world. And sometimes a preacher just has to stand up and put it just that clearly. That's why God sent Jesus. So, essentially, that's the claim Paul is making in this section of his letter. But the letter is so large and so heavy that it's tough to take it all in and understand it. And that's why maybe we need to read our Bible a little more frequently. Now, I found an Episcopalian priest who helped me immensely in understanding the book of Romans. His name is Robert Capon. That's not what I might to say. Um, anyway, and he writes theology books. Guess what else he writes? He writes cookbooks. And I find that a really cool mixture. One of his books is called The Supper of the Lamb. And you don't really know if you're talking about eschatology or mint jelly. You just don't know. But in that book, he raises the question of how we are to make it in this world. Because on a daily basis, or a weekly basis, or a monthly basis, we step out into new places. And I haven't approved this with Rachel, but I'm going to do it anyway, and you can slap me after the service. Rachel has just stepped out into a new place in her life. And yet, she can do it with confidence that God is with her. And we have all done that. We've stepped out into new places in our life. And God goes with her. So, in that book, Capon raises the question, of how we're going to make it through the world. Well, one way that he suggests is the high school yearbook. <coughs> and everybody probably has a high school yearbook with a picture of you when your hair was dark and you were skinny. I've got my white hair. And that's one way we're going to make it through the yearbook. I mean, through the life and the world. The other way is through the ticket window. That maybe we can get a ticket to get through life. Now, do you remember that high school yearbook? It's full of good things that happened in the past. And we see the pictures and we remember our friends. And we see and remember the accomplishments. The accomplishments. And in particular, we recall all of the happy times that we had. And it doesn't matter where you were reared. We had happy times when we were 16 and 17 and 18. And those special events that happened years ago put a smile on our face, even now, some 55 years in my case, later. But those events that happened years ago Sometimes people hang on to them way too long. Events like the crossing of the Red Sea. But that has power for our Jewish friends. The crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. That has power for me. That has power for us. Or there's the high school prom. 
And that has a little bit of power too. Once upon a time, I was young. Once upon a time, my legs would dance. 